I don't always do videos for the live stream announcements, but when I do, it's because it made me cry. It is now 6 a.m. and I've been up since 3.30 and this is not scripted, it is just my raw summary of everything we just saw because, oh my god guys, it's hype! Here is your lore report for 2.3. With this newfound strength, I will defend those who fight alongside me. Protecting my soldiers doesn't just mean having a robust defense in place. It means going on the attack. I'm intrigued by this newfound strength. What newfound strength is Goro going to get that he didn't have as a general during the Civil War? The key to seizing victory in battle lies in remembering the meaning of battle and employing the right tactics to generate momentum. So this guy can summon other hounds to him, you know, the lower hounds that we've been experiencing, and that he can rip portals in between the realms. And that seems like a very interesting skill. We know that the little hounds can corrupt and thin the barrier between realms, but fucking Hound King or whatever, he can just rip one open. And we've seen that the Abyss Herald can open a portal on demand, possibly Abyssal Sibling can as well. But I wonder how different that is between something that, you know, like through magic means opens a portal in a very controlled fashion and a beast that just fucking like takes his claw and tears a rip between time and space. Holy! I love Goro's design. He's so pretty. You never know what's around the corner. Press the advantage! And Oni! The Tenryo Commission recently issued an arrest warrant. Arataki Ito. We've been trying to apprehend him recently. If people see Oni cause trouble again, that'll defeat the whole purpose of the sacrifice he made! Paimon's already on Ito's side. She's like, it'll destroy the whole point of the sacrifice that you made! So we know that he made some kind of sacrifice, which already adds depth to his character, because everything we know about Ito so far is off the rails bozo. Bozo. But now we hear some, some depth. He made a sacrifice for some purpose. What did he make the sacrifice for? How deep was the sacrifice in itself? Come on, man! We won't get away this time! Just give yourself up a- Did you just see his little, like, Hulk stomp? A long time ago, I picked up this rare paper charm. It's very precious to me. When it gets torn, this place goes up in smoke. Ah, that idiot Oni. So we've got another Oni. We've got Ito himself, and then this Oni that he's opposing. And this other one must be, you know, like, tarnishing the reputation of Oni, which have already been tarnished in the past by Chiyo. So they've just got a bad rep these days. And Oni... Maybe Ito's like whole, his goal, his vision, ambition is to help bring Onis out of that bad rep. And this guy's, you know, totally screwing with that with the whole human hostages thing. What did you say, little one? Go on. Say it to my face. Say it to my face. And check out this line where they say, like, they asked him what he was up to. And after he just like went off for a while and his big, Oni Sumo King speech, they just wrote him down as unemployed. <laughs> Man, it's showtime! Oh, coming through! Step aside, Ito's back in town. You've had your fun, now it's good fun. Shut up, would ya? Uh so all of his lines, the, the the verbiage he chooses with this whole like slick in his hair back thing, I spent a while trying to figure out the word for what it reminded me of. And my friends and I have had this uh, joke recently that we think he should have a Brooklyn accent. It's so, like we decided everything we know about Ito, he seems like the kind of guy to have a, a Brooklyn accent. And of course he didn't because we didn't expect that to actually be the case. But the way his animations and lines are portraying him feels very much like 60s greaser. So I feel like we were not far off with the vibe at all. We gave him the kind of accent that has that vibe. And he doesn't have the accent, but he has everything else about it. He's just like, he's such a bozo. The transcendent and miraculous are not the only things to which human beings aspire. They pursue the everyday, the ordinary, to a far greater extent than I would have ever imagined. This mountain we stand on is a cradle of life's profoundest mysteries. Albedo saying this is kind of important to me. 
because Dragonspine lore is one of the most key things we have about the early world. We've learned a lot recently on Sudermi about this ancient civilization, where even the ancient civilization of Sudermi was built upon ruins of something even ancienter. And the only thing we have that's also that old is this nation that was on Salvandagner before it became Dragonspine. And the lore is very, very spicy about what the world looked like back then, what their religious system was like, how it possibly ties into the people on Sudermi. Like maybe it was a continent, you know, Teva wide religious system that's all unified together. And we're actually seeing the same society on Sudermi and on Dragonspine. So Dragonspine really is a vast and terrifying hotbed of possibilities. People are put off by the cold and don't realize that there is much to explore beneath the icy exterior. Are you here to build a snowman too? Hi, Timmy. Let's combine our forces and build ourselves a huge snowman. It'll be a ton of fun. What's on your mind? You seem a little distracted. Some of my alchemy notes are missing. We do not yet know the identity of our thief. Please take care. Dragonspine has become more dangerous than it used to be. Huh? Oh no! Avalanche! Albedo. What the devil do you think you were- Alright, so, so first, this is Albedo launching a cryo attack. Why does Albedo have a cryo attack? Has he acquired cryo powers to augment his geovision? Is he being affected by something that has impressed cryo powers upon him and it's not, you know, like, Albedo really acting here? Or has he always been able to use multiple elements via alchemy versus instead of his vision? And then even more importantly, here Albedo is attacking the crew. We don't see him on our side of the battle because he is the one launching this attack. I, I love this wallpaper. Just look at both Albedo and Ether just staring into us. It's gorgeous. I love it. For one, this whole event, the whole shadows amidst snowstorms, very much, this is what made me cry earlier. That this is what brought me to tears. Because, once again, we're gonna have Albedo in a temporary event giving us critical lore. His notes go missing. There's an avalanche, possibly caused by whoever this thief who stole his notes is. And then all of a sudden we cut to Albedo attacking our main crew. We've always expected this, ever since our first round of Dragonspine content, when his very last line is him thinking to himself in this melancholy way like, If one day I lose control, destroy Mondstadt, destroy everything, can I rely on you to stop me? So he has been foreshadowed to attack Mondstadt. It's weird that it's happening now. Albedo attacking Mondstadt is late game content mid late at like the earliest. So for him to turn against us now feels very, very early. And I wonder if it's to establish a precedent, to show us that something can corrupt Albedo. Something can affect him such that something that Albedo would never want to do, Albedo as we know him would not attack us, would not attack fellow captain of the Knights of Favonius, but something can influence his reasoning, possess him, um, impress suggestion upon him, that would cause him to attack us. So this could just be a minor case that we solve, you know, it stays on Dragonspine. It doesn't become a larger threat. We are able to return Albedo to himself, but it sets us up to not be all that surprised when he launches a full-scale attack on Mondstadt later in the game when we expected it. Beetle fighting, trading card games, spinning tops, kendama, hide and seek, you name it, I can play it. What do you say? Pick one and we'll have a little contest? Just make sure you're ready to get thrashed. <laughs> All right, breaking things down. Ito, obviously we get a story quest for him. I'm pretty excited for this story quest because it looks like it's gonna go into Inazuman culture, the history of Oni and Oni's role in society today. So that's gonna be a very interesting sociological historical lesson, I hope, as well as, you know, having human hostages, but Inazuman history with Ito, which I am excited about. Also, 
I love this chibi team. The the VAs are killing it today. They there's so much chaotic energy going on here. Did you did you see him swing his claymore and then fix his hair? He's the big guy with the horns that would play cards with kids to win all of their snacks from them. Absolute menace. <laughs> if there's anything ever troubling you, don't keep it all muzzled up inside. You can always speak your mind with me. Although I can't guarantee that I'll always have an answer. I'll certainly offer you my best advice. Even when I can't muster much of a response, you can always count on me to be a good listener. Whatever it is, I'm all ears. Goro kind of less so. Not a against Goro as a person. I really like Goro as a character, but just it looks like we're going to see him in a hangout which usually doesn't have much lore and in whatever quest opens up that Wolfhound King. And I think they're they're going to pull a day on us and give us just a little tidbit of some some and then not actually make anything of it. So Goro will give us more lore another time, hopefully. Can we pet his ears? Oh my goodness. Well, that might be a little awkward, but if anyone could pet Goro, it'd probably be the traveler. Not you, Zach, but the traveler. He tra wants some pets! Just to be clear. <laughs> I would like to scratch Goro behind the ears. I do want to draw attention to this fish talisman. Just because it exists, that's a fish talisman. I'm going to put on a tinfoil hat for just a second. But it's interesting to me that we have energy amplifier rerun event happening right now. Because we've had this once before. And the premise of it is that we are helping a Sumeru academic study Erminsel fruits and get data from Erminsel fruits. Erminsel is the world tree. Erminsel fruits have data about the world tree. So we are helping him study the world tree. And I was disappointed by this event before because I was like, oh yeah, Erminsel data. And then they gave us nothing. But it's interesting because Hosseini is the guy who hosted this event before. And we just saw Hosseini in version 2.2 for our reviving Ruin Greater quest. So he just gave us some pretty spicy information about Sumeru, this version. And then are we going to see him again? Just the version right after for a rerun of collecting our minsel fruit? I don't think we're going to get anything out of it today. And by today, I mean this version. But I, I want to say that this is building up to something. Over time, we see Hosseini uh, uh, here and there. We keep gathering our minsel fruit from him here and there. And eventually, he should have some output. We, we collect a bunch of our minsel fruits for him. He should pay that back to us at some point and give us some information that he has discovered from our efforts. I'm not excited to do this event, but I like the pattern it's establishing. I like that we're seeing Hosseini kind of close together, and maybe maybe they're building up to him becoming relevant soonly. Uh, wait, what? <laughs> what was that? Was what? that you, Koi? No, it was Cory. Uh, you can't blame this one on the dog. Oh yeah, these aren't your average guard dog, they're carrying a little sword! But the bottom line is, I can be like Draff or Timmy and have an army of pigeons at my disposal. <laughs> <laughs> I will accept this. <laughs> right. Unfortunately, the lore for these has not been leaked, so I can't say much about the stories that we're going to find behind these weapons. But that Cinnabar Spindle, I think, is going to look fantastic on Albedo. It's got both his, like, navy blue and golds. So maybe, maybe something about him. And then the Redhorn Stone Thresher. It's Jota! And then the artifacts going on coloring. So Ocean Hued Clam, that's going to be Watatsumi lore. It's very Kokomi-esque. That I have high hopes for because what I expect to be the special region for Inazuma, the way we have Dragonspine for Mondstadt and someday we'll have Chasm for Liyue, I feel like Enkonomiya is going to be the special region for Inazuma. And Watatsumi actually has a super deep, super pretty dark backstory to it all based in Enkonomiya, which is this undersea kingdom that Orobashi freed them from and helped them come back to the surface. Enkonomiya is their original kingdom while they were trapped undersea. It's going to be dark. It's going to be super, super full of abyss information, maybe pre like early age god information since this civilization survived back in the times of the Archon War. So. If these artifacts have anything to do with an upcoming release of Enconomia, thank you very much. Husk of Opulent Dreams, coloring again, just based on its similarity to Stone Thresher, I feel like is gonna be some Oni information. And Opulent Dreams brings me back to Ito, or Paimon, talking about Ito's sacrifice. Maybe we're gonna see something of it into his dream, and hopefully they'll 
account for why he doesn't seem to have lost his dream with the loss of his vision. We not know. Perhaps, um, tinfoil hat, crack theory, maybe he did not get depressed when he lost his vision because that was his sacrifice. Maybe in some way he's gonna paint it that, like, he let Sara take it from him as some kind of gesture to improve Oni's reputation. And since he gave it away willingly, it, he didn't have that effect of losing it that we've seen from the Archon quests. But that's a big, big speculative maybe. Don't, don't quote me on that. All right, in sum, I've been like, you know, I was taking notes during the live stream. In sum, I think this version, the fact that this video exists means I think this version is promising. We're going to have Dragonspine event. Dragonspine always has good lore. It's also going to show Albedo turning on us. It's going to show us the kinds of circumstances in which that can happen. That's big. We also have Goro introducing us to a hound. Not sure how much we're going to get from that, but anything we can learn about Abyssal Beasts, I am big on. All that information is going to come together someday. Uh, new artifacts and weapons are going to give us Oni history, Watatsumi history, possibly about Enkanamiya. And we're going to fight dogs with swords and build snowmen, which is adorable. My last note is very important. I don't usually comment on the dialogue that the VAs are given for these announcements, because I hate the flack that they get. The VAs do a great job. It's not their fault that sometimes the script that they're given is kind of cringy. But either the script writer took a lesson or two and gave them better lines, or maybe they just let these guys vibe because the Come and talk with Paimon whenever you have the chance. <laughs> that was a pretty good Paimon. All right, everybody ready? <laughs> the third redemption code is on the way! <laughs> yeah! Woo! I don't I don't want it. Corey, you do one. No. Have a great time, guys. Thanks for watching. I hope you're excited for this version because I definitely am, and I will see you later. Toodles!